Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to the Clown County, County Library for allowing us to use this facility. I also want to thank the members of the League's Voter Services Committee. Um, they put forth all the effort to organize this event. My name is Nancy Esteb, and I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is a 98-year-old national nonpartisan political organization whose purpose is to encourage local citizens to register to vote, become well-informed voters, and participate at all levels of government. The League does not support or oppose candidates, factions, or political parties. The views expressed here tonight are those of the candidates and not of us. The League, however, does act in support of or in opposition <coughs> to selected governmental issues which its members have studied. You can find more information about the League on the membership table over there, or by going to our website, which is lwvcla.org. And that might be someplace on a banner, is it? It's on the agenda. It's on the agenda. In case you can't you know, forget it. Uh, we'll be following the agenda you are given. And if you don't have one, again, just raise your hand and someone will bring you one. Before we begin, um, first turn off all cell phones and devices that make noise. We don't like that. Um, there are restrooms in the lobby. Also, um, about video recording, no <coughs> non-league audio or video recording devices of any kind are permitted during the forum unless prior permission has been received. The League is recording the forum and the video will be posted on our website. Our forum tonight will be in two parts. The first panel will feature the candidates for District Court 1 and the second panel will be the candidates for State Representative Positions 1 and 2. Each panel will follow the same basic outline. The candidates will make brief opening statements, then we'll take questions from the audience, and then the candidates will make their closing statements. We hope you'll be thinking of the questions you want to ask the candidates as you listen to their opening statements. And if you need a card to write on, uh, hold up your hand and the league member will bring you one. To make the most of our time, I ask you to kindly refrain from applauding or making any other noises which in any way interrupt our speakers. I'll be sure to give you a chance at the end of each panel to give a round of applause to the candidates. League members wearing name tags are located around the room and please signal to them if you need assistance with anything. Our timers this evening are Tommy Schwent and Linda Fetchett. Their job is to make sure we stay within the time limits that have been established for each segment of our forum. If you've been to any of our forums, you know we're kind of sticklers about time limits. The agenda provides a summary information on the responsibilities of each office that is being discussed tonight, so I won't talk about that. You can read it. All right, the candidates for the first position, District Court 1, are Dave Newpert and Suzanne Hayden. Both candidates, in the order they filed for office, will be given up to two minutes for their opening remarks. We have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information. Their qualifications for serving in this office, why they are running for the office, what their goals are for their first year in this term of office. Candidates, please keep your eye on our timer so you can gauge your time. You will each have two minutes. We'll begin with Dave Newbert. Thank you very much, and good evening, folks. Can you hear me in the back, Mark? Can you hear me all right? Great, appreciate it very much. Well, I am Dave Newbert, and I'm a candidate for District Court 1 judge, and I want to thank you folks for coming out this evening. I know that you're here at this forum because you care about your community, and so do I, and that's why I am running be your next district court uh, judge. Um, I have literature on the table there that will give you more information about my background and my qualifications and my community involvement, but I can tell you that I am the only candidate uh, in this race who has judicial experience in the district court. 
I was also rated number one in every category by the 2018 Clallam County Bar Bowl for this position. I uh, am here tonight to ask for your vote. Um, I know that I'm well qualified. I've been practicing law in this county for over 25 years and have been a judge pro tem in the district court for about 20 of those years. I have completed the Washington State Judicial College, which I completed just last year in 2017. Uh, the reason I'm running is because I do have uh, experience relevant to this job. I love the community, I love the law, and I want to put my experience uh, to work. Uh, I'm very involved in the community, as you can see from the handout that I have, working currently with several nonprofit groups in this area, including Habitat for Humanity and Peninsula Behavioral Health. And uh, the first year goals that I have to improve the court would be to make, uh, always make sure that offenders who come through the court are held accountable, make good use of community service work, make the best use that we have for therapeutic courts, for people that are a good fit for that, and to uh, always make sure that the court operates as efficiently and effectively as it can. I'm Dave Newpers, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suzanne Hayden, and I'm also running for district court judge uh, here in Port Angeles, and I am uh, very well qualified. I've been uh, working in all of the different uh, courts in Clallam County for the past 23 years. Uh, starting in District Court 1, everyone starts in District Court 1. The last 16 years I've been in Superior Court in the Juvenile Division working with the kids. Uh, and uh, going back to uh, District Court is going to be a lot of fun and amazing and it's going to be a, a wonderful place to make some changes, uh, which is uh, what I would like to do. Um, you'll see some of the ideas in my uh, literature that's over on the, the table. Um, additionally, I want to let you know that I have some amazing endorsements. I am endorsed by Washington State Senator Kevin Vandewig, uh, Washington State Supreme Court Justice Susan Owens, and I practiced with Susan, uh, in front of Susan, for uh, probably about six years out in District Court 2, which is also a district court. Uh, so she knows me very well. Uh, the Jamestown Slalom Tribal Council, uh, Slalom County Superior Court Judge Brian Koganauer, <coughs> Slalom County Retired Superior Court Judge uh, Ken Williams. And those are just some of the, the many people that are endorsing me. Um, and so I think that, uh, that at this point in time, it, I've covered goals, why, and qualifications. I don't know that I have much more to tell you. Um, other than uh, answering your questions. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for asking us. Thank you to both candidates. Next, we'll take as many questions as possible from you, the audience. Please come to the microphone. And there are two, I'm, there's one microphone over on this side and you can line up along that sort of wall. Uh, state your name and specify who your question is for, although both candidates may answer every question. You'll have up to 30 seconds to ask your question. Our timer will hold up the stop sign if you use up that time. A league member will hold the microphone for you. The candidates will have up to one minute to answer each question, so please consider this time limit when crafting your question. It may help you to stay within your 30 second time limit if you write your question out beforehand and then read it when it is your turn at the mic. If you do not wish to come to the microphone, you may give your written question to one of our league members and it will be read aloud for you. The candidates will be given up to one minute to answer each question. Both candidates will have an opportunity to respond to, over, to all questions, even those directed to a specific candidate. I will then give each candidate the opportunity to respond to or rebut their fellow candidates' answers. They will be given up to 30 seconds for a brief response or rebuttal, or if they wish, they may waive their chance to respond. I hope that we will be able to hear all your questions. Please keep in mind that we'll give everyone in the audience the chance to ask a question up to about 30 minutes before taking follow-ups or multiple questions from the same person. 
I expect there will be approximately 30 minutes for audience questions and candidate responses, but this is an estimate. If we run out of time before you get your question answered, we encourage the candidates to remain after this forum so that you may speak with them directly. All right. Anybody want to ask questions? We need to go up to the mic. The uh, uh, in the news you hear about aberrations uh, in sentencing, oftentimes very harsh, oftentimes very lenient. How would you define uh, justice in your court? What are, the, what are the considerations for doing justice? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Ruby, you go first. Sure. Uh, the question was, how do you look, handle sentencing in your court, and what I would interpret it to mean, how are you consistent in your sentencing? And I appreciate that question, because sentencing is an important part of this position, and it's a, it's a part of the job that I am well accustomed to, having been in the position of imposing sentence on offenders who have come through and either pleaded guilty or been found guilty. And when I impose sentence, I consider the seriousness of the offense, the effect it has had on the victim, because when I'm in court, victims will always have the right to be heard. Um, I consider whether the person has prior similar offenses, whether they present a risk of reoffending within the community, if they're amenable to any type of treatment or other requirements, and if there's any sort of expression of remorse. Those are the factors that I look for in deciding whether to impose sentence. In imposing sentence on a gross misdemeanor, the range is from zero days to 364 days. So there's a, there's a broad range of categories that I look at, and there's a broad range of time that I can impose. But that's how I do my best to stay consistent. Ms. Hayden? And I didn't hear the question as consistency. What I heard is, what is justice? What do I consider justice? And what I consider justice is for me to be able to listen to both sides. Um, I need to listen to the prosecutor, so that I hear the story and uh, what's happening with the victim. I need to hear the victim. If that person wants to make a statement or sometimes there's a victim advocate, I need to hear the defense lawyer uh, to find out what's happening as well. Um, almost every story, when you listen to it, is going to be different. Um, there's a, you know, it can be uh, one uh, element, you know, they, the crimes are the same, but the reasons for the crimes are different. And that's what I want to be able to listen to, to be able to figure out, do I get to finish the sentence? <laughs> <laughs> to be able to figure out how to hold a person accountable while figuring out how I can get them out of this cycle as well. Uh, during my time on the bench, I have developed a consistent approach to sentencing. And that's the approach that I will continue going forward if I'm elect when I'm elected as the next district court judge. And that is to make sure that victims have the opportunity to be heard and that I am consistent in my approach to sentencing where I almost get to be where I am predictable. So that when people come to court, they have a sense of reliance on where I'm coming from and where I'm likely to uh, end up after considering all of the factors that I mentioned earlier. Yes. I also intend to uh, start some of these therapeutic courts that are being touted. Uh, there is no uh, DUI drug court, they're calling it one, but it's not one. It's not the model format of a, a DUI uh, of any drug court. I've been involved in uh, drug court over the last 20 years the last 16 years with the juveniles. So that's just one of the kinds of things that I want to be able to get into court to implement because that's the kind of thing that's going to get an entire family out of the cycle of alcoholism. Okay. Here's one right here. Don't get it. Hold on. 
Hello? Hi, Rachel Ringer. Um, I'm on the board of PA CAN, which is Port Angeles Citizen Action Network, and it's about overdose and addiction. So, my question is about drug court, and I would like both of you to answer this question. The sitting district court judge has taken the position that he will not agree to the sta standard drug court contract in two regards. He will not agree to an opt-out period, and he will not agree with medically assisted treatment. This in, this in effect prevents district court defendants from participating in drug court. What is your position on these drug court issues? <coughs> the, uh, well, I can tell you right away, uh, that's one of the problems that uh, uh, drug court has a contract and it has a contract for a reason. The opt-out provision was uh, touted by the prosecuting attorney. Um, they want to be able to determine whether someone's appropriate after somebody's in, so there's an opt-out period. Um, that's very, very important, um, as is the medically assisted um, treatment. Uh, in years past, everybody thought that uh, there should be no uh, medical assistance, that if you're an addict, you shouldn't even take aspirin because that's mood altering because then it takes your headache away. Uh, nowadays, we have looked at lots of studies that are starting to show that medical assistance and uh, the uh, sheriff's office has been very proactive in uh, working with medically assisted uh, addiction problems uh, in the jail right now to help people get started on it. Uh, but that's the cutting edge, that's where we're going. So by by not agreeing to that, he's effectively saying there's no drug court. Um, as Ringer, my position is that uh, the district court judge should make the best use of all available therapeutic court modes. And I, I know that there's a need for that because of my work with Peninsula Behavioral Health, where I currently serve as the board vice president and have gotten to the point where I've become even better educated about what programs are available, what treatment modalities are available, and what is effective. It is not a one-size-fits-all approach. You know that. What is taken into consideration is the individual circumstances, what treatment program is appropriate, and how best to get somebody through that treatment program so they don't go into drug court simply as a way to try to avoid getting a conviction. That's setting someone up to fail. People that have the motivation and are willing to meet all the factors and the criteria of a drug court contract should be encouraged and permitted to do that. Peninsula Behavioral Health does not have a chemical dependency program. That's an entirely separate issue. That's mental health, and they are absolutely something required and, and part of what we're looking at. What was asked is about this unilateral decision that Judge Porter made by striking out some of the provisions and then sending it over to drug court saying, this is what the contract is, and that's all I'm going to allow. Um, Superior Court isn't going to take district court Superior District, Superior is the Superior Court. They've done this for over 20 years. They know what they're doing. Oops, sorry. They know what they're doing and they're not gonna accept it, which means that person can't come in. Well again, I don't approach this issue the way that any other judge, past or uh, current perhaps, approaches it. And certainly my decisions going forward aren't bound by the decisions that anybody has made previously. I'm willing to look at the programs and the policies that best protect the interests of the community while allowing folks who are motivated to get well to be able to receive treatment. <laughs> Good evening, thank you for being here and for running this evening. Uh, for the past number of years, there has not been uh, a huge amount of collaboration between District Court 1 and District Court 2. 
And I'm wondering, uh, my, my question to you is, do you see opportunities for working more closely uh, between the district courts that will either help to save resource and or improve service delivery? And would you be willing to work with the other district court judge to identify such opportunities? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Ozias, for that, for that question. Uh, certainly, I have the ability to work with anybody who's in another district court judge position. Uh, if there's been friction in the past, I'm not carrying that forward. I know both of the candidates for district court to judge. I've known each of them for years. I have respect for both of them. And uh, frankly, would look forward to working with whomever is elected there. You talked about what I think what might be ways of, to collaborate or cooperate. I would work with the judge in District Court 2 to look at uh, best implementation of the 24-7 sobriety monitoring program. I recognize that these are different areas of the, of the county and that the judges that are elected there are, are reflective of the uh, priorities and, and the, what's necessary in each one of those districts. Uh, but I can certainly work with them, uh, whoever it is. The sitting judge at the moment has made a decision not to have cooperation. Uh, judge Doherty has let me know that he has tried many times to discuss this um, and has been rebuffed. Uh, that's, uh, I don't think the, that's one of the reasons that we have a $65,000 uh, pro town budget, which is outrageous. It's the largest it's ever been. We don't need to pay that much for substitute judges. Uh, those are for things that uh, when I have conflicts or if I'm uh, on vacation or uh, I don't take very many sick days, but if that were to happen. And those are the kinds of times that instead of getting and paying a substitute judge, a private attorney uh, who can come in and act, uh, but working with district court too, um, I've already spoken to John Black. Um, Eric and I have known each other for years as well, so I don't see us as, as an issue no matter who's in. But that's exactly what we're going to be doing is having a spirit of cooperation uh, to deal with um, conflicts. Uh, part of the current uh, uh, pro tem judge budget in District Court 1 is based on the fact that the current presiding judge also serves in the uh, United States Air Force and is gone for like a one month at a time during the year and it's necessary for that position to remain filled when that judge is not available. Uh, that necessity goes away when I'm elected because it won't be needing to take a month or, or take a month away from my job each year to do military service. And I certainly don't have uh, the conflicts in hearing uh, cases involving the Public Defender's Office that would necess necessitate bringing in judges pro tem. Uh, in looking at the uh, district court budget, the 30 days that uh, Judge Porter was gone, uh, Mr. Newport was paid $5,000 for that month covering. Um, that's a real difference than saying it's just one 30-day period. This is a $65,000 budget. So, I mean, this is months and months if it's 5,000 at a time. As far as any conflicts with district court, the first thing I did before I even put my, my hat in the ring was call an ethics professor and say, I'm a public defender, I want to run. Um, these are the issues. My husband will be a part-time public defender, although he's also a private attorney. Uh, the public defender's office uh, rents a building uh, from him. How long can I get? You have to stop now. Okay. He said there were absolutely no conflicts unless it's one of the kids that comes up, which is not very often. Um, so it is not an issue. All right, next question. Um, I interpreted the first question uh, as Suzanne did of what is your idea of justice? And Dave, quite frankly, your answer really bothered me because you immediately jumped to sentencing. Uh, you bypassed the question of whether or not someone is innocent or guilty. That concerns me. There's also other considerations of justice, such as disqualifying yourself in conflicts of interest cases. Also, you do handle civil, you do handle civil cases. 
So I'm just wondering what both of your ideas are in, in those respects. Sure. Boy, there is so much there. I hope I remember all of this. Um, uh, certainly in the context of uh, civil cases, uh, it's going to be the same thing. Justice to most people is being heard. Uh, not necessarily having something go their way, but to know that I heard the argument, that I understand the argument, and as long as I can explain this is what the law says and this is the way it needs to go because that's what the law says, um, that is justice to me, uh, and and that's what I believe we need to bring into uh, the courtroom is the respect enough of the individuals coming in, no matter who they are, no matter what their socioeconomic background, whether they are a voter or not, uh, those kinds of things, uh, to have them come in, be able to listen, not be told to shut up, not be told to made to cry, uh, and listen to them and respond to them. Ron, are you sensing as, a, as an example of how um, I understand justice and how I apply it? The way, what justice is to me is following the law and not making up the law. It's knowing and understanding what is required under the Constitution of the United States and under the Constitution of the State of Washington. It's understanding the laws of the State of Washington and the rules of procedure, both civil and criminal, for courts of limited jurisdiction. I am well versed in those areas on having worked as a judge pro tem for years at the district court. I apply the law, I don't create the law. To me, that's justice. I believe there was also the point of conflicts of interest in civil cases, uh, which I'm gonna guess had to do with uh, Mr. Newbert's dog case, which everybody knows about. There's nothing wrong with the dog case. There's nothing wrong with uh, Dave suing his neighbors. That, all of that was perfectly fine. The only issue was the conflict, and that is uh, that they tried to have it with Judge Porter on the bench. Um, you can't have your pro tem judge, your buddy, the person that you want to be judge, uh, that's you don't have that person in front of you trying to choose who's right. That's a conflict. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it seems silly to bring this up now that both dogs were involved in that, in that issue were long since dead. But, you know, there was never any effort to have that case heard by any particular judge. That case was assigned to Judge Jill Landis in <coughs> Jefferson County. She heard it. No effort was made to have that case heard by any other judge. I know that, Ron, because I was there. All right, next question. Uh, question for both of you. It deals with mental health in our court system. And this is based on a conversation we had with our District Court 2 judge today. I've heard about it before. <laughs> In the last two years of this gentleman's life, he was in court for over, or in court, he was in jail for over 400 days. And the whole question is, as it was described by, by the judge today, how can we improve upon this system? Because obviously mental health is a very important issue when we get them in our system. And with, if this is outcome when they jump off a bridge, then that's obviously a travesty. We're, we're not anything good. <coughs> Um, thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for that thoughtful question. Um, the issue of mentally ill offenders is always going to be present in the courts. Now, it was, I, was, it a di was that a district court case, Randy? District court. A district court case where somebody sat for 400 days waiting. A couple, they were in and out, in and out, in and out. Okay. Now, some of that delay could be if um, it is necessary for somebody's uh, competency to be determined. Because a person has to be competent in order for them to stand trial. And if, if they're not competent, the court can look at whether 
competency should be restored. And that process doesn't take, in, take place within any set period of time. 400 days to me sounds like an awfully long period of time to determine whether a case is going to be heard uh, or not. Uh, when I'm on the bench, cases are not delayed unnecessarily. And I know at the state level, the Western State Hospital has had pressure put on it to make sure that it gets its cases resolved uh, uh, in a more timely manner. I didn't hear this as a, an involuntary commitment, um, mental health evaluation for competency. I heard this as a person who has mental health issues. It's almost impossible to comply with their sentence and probation. Therefore, they're constantly brought into uh, jail to serve time for not doing what they're supposed to. That's absolutely one of the things that I am going to change. Uh, it's not jail or you do it, jail or you do it. Uh, there's a, a, an interim segment there that's missing about services. I have uh, a woman who is going to be working with me. Uh, she's uh, uh, got degrees. Uh, she's got uh, her degree is, is in these kinds of services. She's retired. What she wants to do and what she's agreed to do, we're going to find out what the services are. Uh, sometimes even within an agency, different people don't know what the services are. So I'm going to take the time to actually get in touch with agencies, find out what their services are. Um, some people, some agencies will actually meet a person at the jail and take them to their appointment or find out when their appointments are going to be and make sure they get there. Well, Peninsula Behavioral Health and other treatment providers locally are well equipped to deal with folks who are uh, enduring mental health issues. And if somebody is cycling in and out of jail uh, because they're reoffending, and typically the offenses that I see, Commissioner Johnson, involve trespassing cases uh, or a violation of a no contact order, or somebody with mental health issues will continue to come back into court. Uh, it's a matter, it's not one size fits all, it's a matter of finding the right program for that person and I know PBH, for example, does an excellent job at that and I'll continue to work with them. They don't, they're, it, it's, it's less of an opportunity in the West End than it is in District 1. Peninsula Behavioral Health will be good as far as counseling, uh, if someone needs a medication and re-evaluation, those kinds of things. They do not provide door-to-door -door service from the jail to the appointment. Those are other kinds of, of agencies. Uh, people that want to help uh, and are willing to help, but there's just uh, this glitch where we don't know uh, where all these services are, and that's why uh, we have to get together and figure out who's willing to do what. Uh, we have amazing resources. We're kind of a black hole as far as mental health right now. But if we can look at these smaller agencies with people who want to volunteer, that's the way to go. All right. If there are, if there are no more questions, but I think we have an additional question. Yeah. Hi, I'd kind of like to pull back the veil a little bit and ask you what um, challenges have you had in your personal life with your family and your friends yes. to give you a better, oh, Marilyn Smith, to give you a better um, um, depth to be a judge? All right, I'm going to take a little start. Uh, I think that those kinds of questions are uh, interesting. I think that uh, sometimes I'm very comfortable answering those questions. Uh, sometimes I'm not. I will tell you I've never made it a secret that um, I'm 34 years clean and sober. And if somebody wants to talk to me about that or has a, a family member that needs help with that or something, um, I think that would, would uh, give me a lot of depth. Um, any other issues that I have, uh, the Me Too movement and all that, um, I don't think it's appropriate for me to go there. This is, this is my life and, uh, and I do have a depth of experience. I have a lot of empathy for people, uh, but we also need to hold people accountable. And just because uh, uh, we know what it was like 
uh, to be there doesn't mean that it's okay that people are going to commit crimes if they're there. That's, that is not uh, what, what a judge does. We've all been affected to some degree by domestic violence and mental health issues and substance abuse issues within our families, within our friends, within our communities. Um, somebody that I am very close to uh, was intercepted by the Seattle Police Department when that person was about to go over uh, the 45th Street Bridge over Interstate 5. And that act of bravery saved that person's life. That's a perspective that I have on how important it is to intervene. And when you see something, you do something. You act. That's, I don't filter every case that I hear with Smith through that. But that's an experience that I've been able to rely on and to draw on uh, when I'm in the court considering what people's circumstances are. I learned from that, and I'll never forget it. Now, are there all right? Are there any other questions? Well, thank you again. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you for appearing here this evening. I hope you can remain for the rest of the forum and visit with audience members afterwards. Let's give a round of applause for the My, my guardian angel here, Candace, reminded me that I have not given them their opportunity for their final statements. <laughs> so, yes, um, Ms. Haig, you may start first with your final statement. I'm Suzanne Hayden. I am the best candidate for this job. I have uh, extensive experience in all of the courtrooms that, uh, that are in Clallam County. Additionally, in the Lower Elwha Tribal Court, uh, I know what the issues are. Uh, I have been in a courtroom. Uh, whenever I am in a courtroom, uh, that's all you're doing is interacting with the judge. I know what, what courtrooms are supposed to be like and what people are supposed to do. Um, I have amazing um, endorsements and uh, I just want to be able to tell you that I have um, amazing ideas to save money, to uh, go through, change, uh, look at uh, every single docket, see whether it's relevant, see whether it's not. Um, there is nothing that I am going to keep the same in that courtroom. Uh, the current sitting judge has been admonished by the Judicial Committee. He's gotten in trouble for, by the ACLU for his uh, treatment of uh, uh, poor people. Uh, none of that is going to continue. Uh, the overblown, the bloated budgets are not going to continue. Um, it is time for change. Uh, if you want it to stay the same, uh, if you like the way Judge Porter has done stuff, then you vote for my opponent. You want change, you vote for me. Okay, well, I, I want to thank the league again for this forum this evening. I want to... <laughs> I forgot something, too. I want to thank the league again for this forum this evening, and I especially want to thank you folks for your questions, because I know I learn a lot more from the questions than I do from hearing my own uh, answers. And I feel inspired by Raymond Carver, since we're in the Raymond Carver room this evening, who said, I'm always learning something. Learning never ends. And I can tell you, I, I continue to learn while I work as a substitute judge in the court. I've been practicing law in Clallam County for 25 years, and folks, I'm just getting started. I am looking very forward to being your next district court judge. I will put my experience as the only, only candidate with judicial experience to work. I'll put my community involvement to work to serve your folks to the best of my ability. I'm Dave Newper. I love the law. I love this community, and I ask for your vote. And thanks again for your time and attention.
Thank you again. And now we will have a little switcheroo while these people go away and our next panel comes up. All right, we're ready to begin our next panel. Um, we're missing one of our candidates. Um, we will be following the same format that we used in the previous panels. We remind you that a brief description of the responsibilities of the offices that these people are uh, running for is on your agenda. The candidates are Mike Chapman, Jody Wilkie, Steve Berenger, and Jim McIntyre. Um, all four candidates will be given three minutes for their opening remarks. We have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information. What are your qualifications? Why are you running for this office? What are your goals for the first year of this term of office? And candidates, please keep your eye on the timers so you can gauge your time. And we'll begin with Mike Chapman. Thanks everyone for being here to thank you for the league for hosting these forums. I always kind of figure these are like a Norman Rockwell moments. Uh, you know, people coming in off the streets and out of their neighborhoods to listen to candidates running for local office. So I'm Mike Chapman, I'm your state current league your state representative and prior to serving as your state representative, I was honored to serve four terms as your Clallam County Commissioner. And before that I had a 10 year law enforcement career. Uh, my wife and I live here in Port Angeles. My wife runs a small business here in Port Angeles. We raised two boys, uh, graduates of Port Angeles High School, and they're both in college, uh, doing really well. And uh, a lot of people don't realize my wife's family dates back to the 1880s on the North Olympic Peninsula, and there's family land that's been owned uh, since that time. And so we're certainly rooted in this community. Uh, we, my wife runs a small business. I've been in public service here in law enforcement. And political career and so we're certainly rooted in the North Olympic Peninsula we love this area we think it's a pretty special place and it's been an honor to serve you as your state representative a um, couple of highlights in my first term securing 32 million dollars for a brand new Elwha River Bridge that was not an easy task and as a member of the Transportation Committee it took me some work and a lot of support from the community to secure 32 million dollars to have that bridge and it'll be being replaced about this time next year. Moving forward, one of the priorities for a new term will be lowering the manufacturing B&O rate for rural manufacturers. We know that as our economy has recovered in this state from the recession, that manufacturing jobs still lag where they were pre-recession. The state gave Boeing a very preferential tax rate to stay in this state, but we didn't help rural Washington. And so I put in bipartisan legislation last year in a short session, and I'm working with to reintroduce bipartisan legislation to lower the rural manufacturing B&O tax rate. Manufacturing jobs average between sixty and eighty thousand dollars a year with good benefits and, and good op good opportunities. And so that's a way to really spur our economic growth. One other thing that I'm really proud of is that I prime sponsored fifteen pieces of legislation my first two years. Eight became law, but all fifteen were bipartisan. And I really believe in working across the aisle to find solutions for our community. And I'll continue to work hard in a bipartisan way to find solutions. Thank you again for being here. Well, hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. And welcome to all of you, too. Um, my name is Jody Wilkie, as you know. Um, I'm a single mom. Um, I've worked in the private sector all my life. Currently, I'm a nurse. And I've had a lot of different experiences that have prepared me for this moment in life. I think a lot of us can look back on our lives and wonder how we got here. And I do the same thing. But, you know, I look at the things that I've done, and it seems like it just gives me an advantage that maybe some other people don't have who've been really focused on public service as their um, as their primary uh, goal in life. Um, so as a single mom, I raised my two kids. I've, um, I've worked as a construction worker. I had my own construction company. 
And um, that was really very interesting, so I got some exposure to that industry. Um, I worked for the laborers' union and completed their apprenticeship program, which I was very proud to do. Um, I also worked in the yacht manufacturing industry and was elevated from the front desk clerk all the way up to the engineering department where I was given some awards and recognized nationally for my work in the change management program there. Um, that brought me into working with some computer systems and led me from that point to working in the airline industry, um, which unfortunately the company that I worked for was devastated during the 9-11 attacks and I had to take another look at my career and, and decide as a single mom what I'm going to do. So uh, the unfortunate thing with that is it's, it's always hard to pick yourself up and start again, but I've had to do that a few times. And I always seem to come out doing quite well. Um, I ended up in the um, mortgage industry and I worked with investment real estate and that was extremely interesting, and that actually is one of my uh, big interests and something that I can hope that I can do for um, our district as I move into this role. Um, unfortunately, we all know what happened with the real estate market <laughs> back in the 2000s, and um, I ended up having to send myself back to school at age 50. I went back to college and studied to become a nurse, which is what I am right now. Nursing is one of the most trusted, um, trusted employment jobs in the uh, United States. And also, as you know, I'm not a public speaker. It's, it's a little unnerving, and I don't know that I'll ever get used to it. So if I stutter a little bit, please excuse me. One of my goals for the district is to turn our economy around. You know, um, Mike may have been in, in the legislature for the last two years and accomplished a lot of really good things, I'm sure. But what I ask you is to take a look at the economy in our district and, and how has that helped the little person? How has that helped the average person? Our, um, our people, <laughs> I guess I have to stop. We, we are about 20 to 30 percent poorer on every income level. Our GDP hasn't increased and our unemployment remains high. And I'd like to fix those things. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perringer? Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Theringer, your state representative. I've been honored by you to serve in four terms in the legislature, eight years, and I'm asking for your vote for a fifth term. In that time, I've been able to position myself as chair of the capital budget in the House. I sit on the Appropriations Committee, and I also sit on the Health and Wellness Committee. And those three committees, I think, are very helpful for the issues we face here on the peninsula. And I guess the, we're supposed to talk a little bit about what the job is, and I think a lot of you know the separation of government, so we're the legislative branch. We make the laws and we set the budget, the appropriation for the state. So as chair of the capital budget in the House, I have a lot to say of, so there's three fiscal committees. There's the operating budget, there's the transportation budget, and then the capital budget. So I build, the capital budget works to fund four-year colleges, K-12 school construction, clinics, <coughs> mental health hospitals, um, uh, a lot of natural resource issues, uh, the culvert replacement, for example, investment in habitat, and that sort of th that sort of thing. As being on the health care committee and working, uh, also being on the appropriations <coughs> committee, I've worked to be able to strengthen our rural health care system. When I first got in the legislature, I helped designate Olympic Medical Center as a sole community hospital, and that entitled them to a higher reimbursement rate in Medicaid. And then this year, Mike and I were able to re increase that rate by 25%, which meant there was about $1.3 million that came from the state and about $2.7 million that came from the federal government to help us manage our costs, because that's a huge challenge because of our payer mix here in, on the peninsula, but in rural Washington. So being able to develop the policy in the health care committee and then make sure that the budget numbers follow through in the appropriations committee is helpful, I think, for the issues around healthcare here on the peninsula. Um, as you know, I've been on the peninsula for 40 years, moved out here in 1977, and had a wood manufacturing business for the first 10 years, and then got involved in county policy, actually in the planning commission. I served on the county planning commission 
for I think six, seven years, was chair of that for a couple of years, and then was your county commissioner for three, three terms starting in 2000. Mike and I served together, as you know, for 11 years with uh, Commissioner Doherty, um, which I think was a pretty good run here in Clown County. So, um, honored to be here tonight. It's great to see such a good turnout. Sometimes I think that here on the peninsula, we try to make our own fun. And for some people, this is fun. So, and I'm one of those people, so thanks for coming. <laughs> Good evening. I don't know if this is fun, but it's certainly educational and enjoyable. Uh, Jim McIntyre. I've uh, lived here on the peninsula with my wife Sherry for a, a little over the past 12 years. I had the honor of representing the east end of the county on the Port of Port Angeles Commission, and then as a, a commissioner on the Board of Cloudland County Commissioners. Prior to that, um, as many of you might know, I was a Coast Guard officer for a number of years, retired in uh, 2000 as a captain, spent another six years in Washington, D.C. as a senior uh, career civilian official, uh, retired from the senior executive service from the um, Department of Homeland Security, had enough of D.C. and moved out here, and the rest you know. The the plan for the first year in the legislature, number one, there's a learning curve, as with everything. Number two, it's to find a seat on the committees that are of most relevance to the 24th district. Those would be committees involved in natural resources and agriculture, uh, business regulation, taxation, environmental regulation, and the like. Um, there is um, a lot to learn about the state budget. I was the Coast Guard's budget officer. It was one of my last duties when I was on active duty in the Coast Guard. And let me tell you, the federal budget, which I have some knowledge of, is a model of clarity and transparency in comparison to the state budget. So it takes an, an awful lot of study and um, digging through the, the various pots of money to find out exactly what is, is supposed to happen and then look and see what actually has happened to find out if what we're doing at the state level is actually working. Um, and so I, I don't know if I need to take up all of the, the three minutes. I really do want to get to your questions because I think as, uh, as was said previously, I learn a lot by just listening to your questions and trying to think up an answer that makes sense to them. So thank you for being here. Thank you to the League for sponsoring this forum, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, candidates. Now we will take as many questions as possible from you, the audience. We'll follow the same procedures as with our previous panel. Please come to the microphone and state your name. We were a little sloppy about that with the last panel. Not everyone gave their name, so please do so this one. Um, you will have up to 30 seconds to ask your question. The candidates will be given up to one minute to answer each question. And um, tell us which of the sets of two and two your question is directed to. And each of the two will have a chance to answer and rebut each question. Over here. And if you have questions, you should line up over there. And if you uh, refer not to line up, but just have your questions submitted, uh, we have someone here who will, you can write your questions out. Just make sure you put your name on it, and we'll be happy to do it. If you don't wish to come up to the mic, we will read your question for you. All right, first question. Marilyn Smith, and this is actually for everyone. Um, I, um, I keep hearing a lot about you know, manufacturing. We're far off the beaten path. What I would like to know is what we can do, what you would do to, to um, fix our fiber optic problem. We had fiber optic laid. The city of Port Angeles basically has blocked it, so nothing west can get it. Um, we really need to have fiber optic for um, enterprise. 
uh, business in this area. It's a perfect area for for a programmer, so what would you do? All right. Um, I totally agree. Uh, I mean, broadband fiber optics is really a utility. Um, if we look at education, if we look at healthcare, telemedicine, if we look at, uh, as the questioner mentioned, you know, a, a programmer's ability or a designer's ability to move files in and out, I mean, broadband is fundamental. So. Uh, as capital budget chair, we funded some, uh, we put about $18 million into the Community Economic Revitalization Board to start looking at rural communities and the need for broadband. And in the world of broadband, that's not a lot of dollars, quite frankly. And, but what we, what, what we, why we did that is we wanted to get a <coughs> sense of where the need is. I mean, what's, I mean, I get the weeds about broadband pretty quickly, but there's a lot of dark spots but what's interesting about the dark spots is one of the commercial cable companies or, a, or Verizon will run a cable to say a hospital and then they'll say there's coverage in a 60, 70 mile radius when it's not true. So one is you gotta define the problem and then secondly, um, you know, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's a short time, I'm just getting going. <laughs> All right, Mr. McIntyre, would you like to? Yeah. One minute goes by pretty quick for a southerner with a different cadence of speech. I look at rural broadband in the same fashion that uh, the federal government looked at rural electrification back in the 20s and 30s. It's, um, it's almost a necessity and I agree with my opponent that it's, uh, it is a priority. I understand there was a bill that had strong bipartisan support in the legislature last year that just didn't get addressed for whatever reason. So I would expect that would be revived in this upcoming session. And uh, should I have the honor to represent you, I would, uh, I would be a strong supporter of that. There are existing legal authorities right now for PUDs and ports um, to do, uh, to install, um, fiber optic or communications uh, infrastructure of various various kinds uh, on a wholesale basis. They can't sell at the last mile retail, as it were. But I would surely be interested to see how that might be might be accomplished in a in a joint fashion. Thank you. Karen Sir, would you like to rebut? Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything to rebut there, but I, I will just say two weeks ago I spent three days in Denver on a, as a representing the state in the National Conference of State Legislators on broadband. And one of the things I learned there is there, there's literally hundreds of millions of dollars available out there through the federal government, through the cable companies themselves. So what we need to do is, and I think the governor is working on this, have a coordinator in his office so that we coordinate those different funding sources and then use, I think, the state dollars to sort of match that to fill in those gaps. But I think you'll see a pretty robust effort to get broadband out into the areas that aren't served at this point. Thank you. Back, Mr. McIntyre, would you like to respond? No. All right. Now, Mr. Chapman, would you like to answer? Is your microphone moderator. Mr. Chapman, would you like <laughs> to uh, first of all, I serve on the Community Economic and Revitalization Board, so I'm actually one of the deciders who moves that $18 million, and we've been moving it out this, this summer. Also supported legislation to bring broadband to the Macaw Tribe and to the Quinault Tribe, and working with uh, uh, the private sector, and those projects are moving forward. But one of the other things about broadband, and we saw earlier this year, the federal government want to put a break on our internet speeds and our access to the internet and so Washington State I'm proud to say on a large bipartisan vote of 93 to 5 off the House floor 35 to 14 off the Senate passed House Bill 2282 becoming the first state in the nation to protect your internet speeds so we could have put all this backbone out there and still left it up to the private sector they could have controlled our internet speeds and so we are the first state in the nation to have true net neutrality I've been to a lot of these forums, and as Jim has said, it's always a learning experience. Um, 
I have learned that the PUD departments are very interested in trying to help get broadband through to the remote areas, and that's a big thing that, con that they consider as a part of their budget and trying to maintain um, liquidity on into the future. So uh, from the state level, I was informed early on in the campaign that there had been a proposal to put about $100 million into rural broadband by Representative DeBolt, that that didn't make it through the committee process. And when I take a look at decisions that are made like that, we have to decide if that didn't make it through the committee process, it was because something else held a higher priority for the funding. And so this then becomes an issue of deciding what our priorities really are and where we want to spend that money. Thank you. Would you like to do any rebuttal? All right. Our next question. Uh, I'm Denise Matistad. I live in Swim. Uh, as many of you know, the Swim North Peninsula area has a large population of seniors. And what I'd like to know from you all is what are you, what do you see the legislature doing and what can be done to help provide a good continuum of service and lifestyle for our seniors in this area? All right, let's start with Mr. Chapman on this one. Well, like Steve mentioned, uh, we've got to make sure we have health care, the health care workers, the trained workforce for the next generation. So. We knew there's a nursing shortage on the North Olympic Peninsula, and so we worked with the community college, and we were able to get a budget proviso to start the second nursing program at Peninsula College to make sure that the need for nursing. There's also a tremendous need for medical assistance, surgical technicians, and so we're working hard to make sure that those um, college programs are fully funded. Also, our local hospitals. We, put a, we have Medicaid reimbursement rates for low-income seniors and for other low-income folks. And we're making sure that we're putting the money in. We put a significant amount of money into the Grace Harbor Community Hospital to keep that hospital solvent. We're working with Olympic Medical Center. We also funded, and I'm probably stealing a little bit of Steve's thunder because he did all this through the capital budget. And these were some priorities. There are tough choices that you have to make, but we also supported the Demo Clinic for low-income uh, medical and dental and brand new dental clinic over in Jefferson County. We also, earlier this year, <laughs> enacted a 30 cent per thousand property tax decrease cut that will help the seniors too. That stop comes off awfully quick, doesn't it? <laughs> As a nurse, I will say I'm glad for the robust support for the medical community and I know how that affects seniors because that's the um, industry that I actually work in and I love working uh, as a nurse. So, um, and I also appreciate the fact that they've looked at education for nurses, but one thing that that program overlooked was an LPN to RN bridge, and that's something that I would like to bring to the table uh, as, as I go into the job. Um, I am very much into um, keeping taxes low, because I know how much that affects people on a fixed income. In fact, that's what actually brought me into politics in the first place was sticking up for the senior citizens over in Jefferson County when they wanted to impose a, a property tax increase. So um, I applaud the 30 cent decrease that Mike has managed to put into place. Unfortunately, it cost us a buck to get that 30 cents back when they raided the rainy day fund. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, time to stop. Strange credulity to say that cutting your taxes for next year costs you a dollar. It's saving you 30 cents per thousand, and the state has put a billion dollars of new money into the rainy day fund this year, fully complying with the Constitution, and the state has more money in the rainy day fund than ever before. And in another bill that I worked on was House Bill 2747, which would give seniors the ability to write off their property tax, their medical expenses. It's a bill I'm going to bring back next year because I think that's one way that seniors can also have property tax relief. Oh, sure. Why not? In the spirit of fun. Um, 
I think the, the deal with the rainy day, rainy day fund is, is a little unclear. Um, they took $100 billion, or shall I say, diverted it. And it was scheduled to go into the rainy day fund, but was managed to be diverted out of it. Now, if we're going to have an increase in social services and things like that, we are going to need to be prepared for times when our revenue is low. We may have the most amount of money in our rainy day fund than ever before, but I'm telling you, at this rate, we're going to need it. All right. Mr. McIntyre, would you like to answer? <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter. Well, oddly enough, the one thing that I think is job number one for seniors is to increase permanently the Medicaid, Medicaid reimbursement rate. Um, such low uh, reimbursement rates really make it difficult for medical care uh, practitioners and providers to make a living out here. If they can't make a profit, they won't be here. And that's really a, a shift in cost to private pay um, patients of whatever medical care providers there are out here. And ultimately it could mean an increase in property taxes because of the, the necessity for uh, hospitals like OMC to uh, come to us, the taxpayers, to make up the difference for their uncompensated care, which they have done in the past. So that's number one. Number two is to do any and all things that either remove impediments from economic growth or add things that encourage economic growth so that the people that, that change our bedpans in the hospitals and, and the like can make a living here. And I'm getting a stop signal. Uh, as folks know, we live in the oldest district in the state. Our median <coughs> age is about 65, and the 24th legislative district is how the rest of the state's going to look by the end of the decade, or certainly in the next 15 years. And so I co-chair the Joint Executive Legislative Committee on Aging, which is House and Senate members and Executive Branch members. And we actually just had a meeting on Tuesday looking at a number of issues, but the best strategy is to allow people to age in place and provide a continuum of care from staying in your home, Then, and almost 80% of the in-home care is provided by family members. So looking at that, looking how do we provide training for them, how do we provide respite for them, and then as you move around the, along the continuum, at some point you have maybe someone come into your house, an individual provider. Then maybe it's an adult family home. Then maybe it's assisted living, then it's a nursing home. As you move through that continuum, but we're gonna to need to support all of that. The state spends about four, two and a half billion dollars on long-term support services. And then pensions and COLAs for folks that are retiring to make sure that they aren't having to make the choice between their drugs, their food, and their rent. Thank you. Mr. McIntyre, would you like to rebut? Not, not to rebut, but just to supplement my answer. Um, here's an economic statistic for you for Clallam County. 46% of our school children come from families that are poor enough to qualify for free and reduced meals in school. That tells me that somewhere around half, maybe a little bit less, of our uh, young families with school-age kids are really in desperate economic straits. How can we as seniors live in a place without workers? Um, and so the economy underpins everything. Um, Mr. Ferringer, you have 30 seconds if you want to use it. No, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Hi, I'm Deborah Pitts, and I'm from Swim. And I'd like to ask this question about Oregon. If there was a bill to make Washington State a sanctuary state, how would you vote? All right, um, Mr. Ferencher, would you like to start? I've never heard of any such legislation, but I think... Uh, um, California is a sanctuary state. Yeah, so um, I think overall, in a, as being a public servant, looking at what government provides, 
Humanity is probably, and human to human relations is probably number one, so I'd support it. Well, immigration, of course, is in the province of the national government. I'm going to try to look over here so I don't run over my time. Um, and I, I wouldn't support such legislation because anything that inhibits communication and cooperation between law enforcement agencies, both at the local, state, and national level, I think, uh, tends to uh, hurt public safety. And so I, I, I would not be inclined to support such a, such a bill if it were to come up. Would you like to say anything else? Would you like to say anything nope. else? That's All right. Ms. Wilkie? Okay. Should such a bill come up, I would vote against it. Um, I really believe in the sovereignty of the United States. I also noticed that we spend a lot of money supporting um, people who are not resident um, citizens here. And this takes away from things. We're asking questions about rural broadband um, and how to help the people that are already living here to uh, make a living. And these are kinds of things that draw on uh, the generosity of the American people. So I would have to vote against something like that. So uh, these are those moments in these forums where this isn't a serious question because this piece of legislation has not been drafted. There's nothing to look at. You don't know it's whether it would be a one paragraph bill or 50 pages. Lots of our legislation is one page. Lots is 50 pages and more. And it's not a serious question because I don't have a bill number to say I sponsored it or I didn't co-sponsor it. So one paragraph, just a, just a statement that says Washington is a sanctuary state. Nobody would draft such a bill, nobody would drop such a bill, and nobody would support such a bill. But a comprehensive immigration reform bill where the state took the lead because the federal government's not acting on, I might look at it if it's comprehensive, if it makes sense for our community. So again, hypothetical bills could be from a paragraph to dozens and dozens of pages, and I don't know, I can't answer that question. No such statement bill has been drafted nor would I support just a statement bill like that. But comprehensive immigration reform from a state perspective might make some sense since the federal government really is inactive on that issue right now. Mike, how can you say that that's not a uh, serious... We won't have follow-up questions follow -up. yet. I'm sorry. Well, uh, Ms. Said Stanton, it wasn't would you a serious like to question. That? It was serious. Sure. It's a, it's a concept question. I appreciate the seriousness and the serious nature of that question because I come from Port Townsend which has declared itself a sanctuary city. So I understand that, and I understand the problems that the police officers have in dealing with these issues. <clears throat> um, I would also point out, however difficult it might be, that this non-answer is, um, I guess, classic. Uh, we had direct questions asked on several different occasions and find it difficult sometimes to get a straight answer from my opponent, which is unfortunate. Um, I think I would like a straight answer on the sanctuary concept. And um, I would also like a straight answer on other things like the, the carbon bill. Um, and I would also like a... Your time has expired. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Mr. So Chapman, let's hope like we can get some else? straight answers. All right. All right. Then we're ready for our next question. This question uh, is from uh, Mel Clausen and it's addressed to Mike and Joe. Uh, what are your top two goals once elected or re-elected and be specific on how you will achieve these? All right, Mr. Chapman, you start. Like I said, I drafted legislation last year to lower our B&O manufacturing tax rate. I built a large bipartisan coalition business groups, labor groups, folks across the political spectrum, politicians across the political spectrum. So that's gonna be a bill with probably a couple of dozen, if not over 30 co-sponsors. And it's my number one priority moving forward to help move our rural economy forward. A second bill that's really important to me is a, a bill that I worked with Commissioner uh, Johnson last year. It's the Veterans Levy Bill. 
So currently when counties levy the veterans levy for veteran services, low income veteran services, it actually is debited against the county general fund. And I drafted a bill and we're gonna build some bipartisan coalition to allow that levy to move out of the general fund so that counties can continue to increase the veterans levy without impacting their general fund. So those are two of my high priorities to help veterans, to help our economy move forward. No rebuttal on that. Nope. Hope this isn't counting part of you. No. Okay. Well, um, one of my top priorities is to try to help deal with the housing crisis. That intersects closely with the problems that businesses are having in this area, and of course the B&O tax would also help to, to improve that situation. But um, I would like to take a look at the Growth Management Act and how that's affecting the ability of our communities to build housing where we need it, when we need it, and also how that affects the ability for businesses to grow their business because they're prevented from building the types of facilities that they need in order to um, continue to grow and prosper. So this is a big interest of mine, having been previously in the um, mortgage industry and investment real estate. And I know that there's a lot of ways that we can come together and do that and, that, and provide low-cost family homes for people that are not necessarily supported by government programs. I would like to see us at least have some sort of a balance in the housing industry where we are always looking to the government to provide what they call affordable housing. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Would you like to? <coughs> would you like to? All right, Ms. Wilkie, would you like another 30 seconds? Um, I'm good. All right. Lovely. Next question. Thank you. I learned an interesting new term. Oh, I'm sorry. Ron Richards. An interesting new term. I guess I've been aging in place waiting to ask this question. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, a specific bill like uh, House Bill 2341, uh, which you and, and Steve and, and Kevin uh, helped defeat last year, would have given uh, military uh, control of land use planning in the state of Washington. Would you oppose that bill if it comes up again? I, I, the question is to all four of you. Okay. Let's start with McIntyre. <coughs> to make sure I'm clear on the question, Ron, this was a bill that would have given the military control over land use planning? Any commander of any military base, no matter how small within the state of Washington, would have had veto power over any local regulation for land use planning. It had affected the military base in any way. Well, that, that seems rather strange of a bill to come up in the legislature because it seems to run a foul of the, at least the Tenth Amendment to the national to the federal constitution because I don't think land use planning is reserved to the to the national government. Um, so I, I'm just curious about how that bill is characterized. Certainly, on the on the peninsula, we've had a presence of the military, the Navy in particular, but uh, Air Force and Army for quite some number of decades. So. Um, you know, the military has generally been a good neighbor. We have the Coast Guard installation right here in our, in our Port Angeles Harbor. And so I, I would look to see how we can improve on that relationship between local governments, the state government, and the military, not, not, um, not anything even remotely like what you just described. I don't know if that bill is, uh, if Representative Rees is still working on that bill. Um, part of the idea is if you imagine uh, Trent Bays Lewis McCord 
and their landing and takeoff areas. And we can sort of relate to that because of what's happening with our airport here. So the idea was to have the military's input on land use around their bases. I think it went too far. Obviously, we didn't support it. But I think the, the idea is to have better dialogue with the Department of Defense on what, with the community, on what they're doing and what the community is planning on doing. And I, I think those are the refinements that might be coming with the, with the, you know, during the interim and working on the legislation. So that dialogue, I think, is always helpful. Obviously, giving up local control around land use to Washington, D.C., which is ultimately what you'd be doing, doesn't seem to make good sense. Mr. McIntyre, would you like 30 more? Further. Mr. Sterringer? Ms. Wilkie, would you like to answer this same question? I'm going to take a stab at this, um, not being involved in um, this sort of question before. I did anticipate that it had something to do with the effect of the bases uh, and the land around it, the people that live there. Like we have the problem over on Whidbey Island with the Growler Base offending a lot of the people who moved in there. Um, and that is, a, it is an issue. Our, our military needs to be supported with their activities and not wind up in a bunch of lawsuits after the fact because people don't like the loud planes. So um, I think that I would try to uh, involve more communication, like a group of experts to advise on this issue um, because I can certainly see both sides. One of the big concerns that I would have would be if they're going to take land out of useful service or off the tax rolls because of its proximity to a base, how will that affect the, the tax uh, generating ability of that land for the county and, and for the state? So that would be something to consider among probably many other issues. Sorry, I've got to stop. Mr. Chapman? So this was a bill, uh, this is awkward. This was a uh, prime sponsored by a, by a member of our Democratic caucus, uh, Representative Reeves, and it would have allowed the, the basically as written initially, would have allowed the military to come in and kind of override local zoning, local planning. And I, I, I personally led the charge against that because I didn't want to give up our sovereignty as a community. And all the, as obviously 16 years experience as a county commissioner, I understand that you go through a lot of public meetings and this would have bypassed all the public meetings and just let a military commander come in and take, basically tell the local government what they were gonna do for the military. So a little awkward to argue and, and, and build a coalition against a, a democratic bill, but it was the right thing to do. Plus a lot of public input from this district came in and uh, the military is kind of looking at some public meetings. So there'll be a public meeting coming up uh, real soon in Jefferson County. So they're kind of rolling back out to get some of their thoughts and ideas We'll have to watch this because, again, we don't want to give up our local control, our local planning decisions. Thank you. Ms. Wilkie, would you like 30 more seconds? I agree in terms of not wanting to take control away from local communities as far as land use is concerned. Uh, that is, a, is an issue. So, um, but I think that it's... Um, extremely harmful to our military and even to the communities that surround these bases to have an expectation that they can come in after the fact and try to modify the type of activities that our military needs in order to practice their um, maneuvers and to keep us safe. Uh, we need to have our military supported and we need to have their ability to perform their um, whatever you call them practice sessions without hindrance. Mr. Chapman, would you like? Again, the, the way the bill was originally drafted, it became large bipartisan opposition. Communities from all around the state were weighing in, so Republicans, Democrats, and that's why that bill died. We'll see how it comes forward next year, but we'll need to watch this. Ron, I know you were a watchdog. Many people from Jefferson County will watch this carefully, and we'll see how it comes back. It'll have to build, uh, but it was bipartisan opposition. So. All right, next question. Hi, I'm Marsha Lamos from SQUIM. I have a question somewhat related to land use. We live, obviously, in a very beautiful and peaceful place, as we're very fortunate to do. 
historically, this community has been uh, somewhat dependent on resource extraction, if you will, economically. I've uh, spoken with people who lived here in the 70s who said PA used to be booming. Um, how do you value the environment today? All right, we will begin with, Mr. with Mr. Chapman. <laughs> So if you're concerned, if you believe that climate change is real like I do, and if you're concerned about the impacts of climate change, you can be very proud that you live on the North Olympic Peninsula. You can be very proud that you live in a community that sequesters much more carbon than we ever generate. And as we move forward, it's, it's really clear that about 25% of the carbon the United States generates is sequestered in the coastal forests of Washington, Northern California, and Oregon. So we're doing a, we have a great environment to sequester carbon to combat climate change. We also have an economy and a natural resource-based economy. And so what I believe is that Rep Representative Kilmer, through his Forest Service Collaborative, which I was able to secure funding to staff that collaborative, is going into the Forest Service with, so with very intensive and selective thinnings to thin the forest, take that wood to product. Once it's made into a wood product, that carbon is sequestered forever, leaving healthier trees with more space to grow bigger, st stronger, taller, and sequester more carbon. And the number two, generally the number two carbon emitter in our state is wildfires. And so by working our natural, by working our forest, we can combat wildfire uh, loss as well. All right. Um, how do I value the environment? Yes. That's kind of an, um, going off on a little bit of a different tangent. Um, well, so there is a um, tension between human habitation and the environment that's sort of just naturally inherent. And I, I really think that we need to be careful as citizens in this area that we respect the environment, that we we need to have some growth, but we need to have it in a healthy way. So um, I, would, I would look for ways to promote that type of healthy growth. Um, I agree with this carbon sequester concept, although <coughs> the, the small trees, not the big trees, that sequester carbon faster. Um, the young trees that are growing, just the same as our young teenagers, eat everything in sight. So the similar thing with the trees. So, so the small trees, as they're growing, um, sequester carbon much better than the old growth big <coughs> trees. Um, that, that kept in mind, um, I think that we need to do what we can to promote our industries that will utilize that resource in a healthy way. It's a very scientific resource. Right, Mr. Chapman, would you like to rebut? So everybody will say that uh, we're for the environment, we're for the economy, and I'm really I'm honored. I'm the vice chair of the Ag and Natural Resources Committee, and after two years in the legislature, I was voted as an environmental champion, and I also won a national award as the Washington State Legislator of the Year by the Rural Jobs Coalition. So I actually believe and have walked that you can do both. You can be an environmental champion and receive a national award by the Rural Jobs Coalition. And that's a fundamental value I believe as a county commissioner and I take to the state legislator, obviously incredibly humbled to receive those awards. I don't know if he can do it, why can't I? <laughs> yes, that's all I have to say about that. I think that when I'm in place, I'm going to do just everything that I can to do a great job looking out for our environment and looking out for the economy and our people in this area. And I think that every opportunity should be pursued to do both. Um, I agree with my seatmate, uh, my chapman. It's a false choice that you have to choose between economic development and, and environmental health. And when we look back at the 70s and the harvests that were happening in the 70s, those were not sustainable. I mean, there's no way that the forest would have produced that. We were cutting trees that have been growing for centuries, and now the discussion is back again because it's you know it's about a 40, 50 year cycle, and now the forests are coming back. But we can find that balance. This is a great place, one of the best places on the planet to grow trees. And as Mike mentioned, there's some huge advantages around carbon sequestration, and if we develop the 
sort of ecosystem values around that, I think uh, we can even get some, not just environmental climate benefit, but some economic benefit. As some folks know, I piloted a project uh, to build 24 classrooms around the, the state with mass timber from my position on the capital budget. We built four of those in Carlsberg at the Gray Wolf School. And that's an example of where we can get value added out of small thinnings out of the forest. But um, the only other comment I would make is, as far as the environment, is the issue around climate change. It's very real. It needs to be addressed. And if we don't deal with it now, and there's going to be costs, there will be greater cost, costs in the future. All right, Mr. McIntyre. Well, I, I do think we have in this state a, a custom and a, and a culture of valuing the environment. Uh, so I would, I would certainly look to continue that. Where we have soiled our nest, so to say, in the past, I think we can continue to do things to clean up those, those problems that we've created in a way that really doesn't stress the economy for, for local citizens. But, the other thing is to put equal value and equal emphasis on economic growth. For instance, the Department of Natural Resources right now is considering a sustainable harvest plan that will sequester more timber, state-owned timber, that provides funds for my opponent's budget for school construction and money to local taxing districts, districts counties, fire districts, and so on. Uh, in favor of a, a seabird called the Marble Murrelet. We've seen this movie, new movie before with the Northwest Forest Plan, and that, that is likely to really damage this county's in particular economy. All right, Mr. Theringer, again. <coughs> Just a little bit of clarification on the Murrelet. Actually, the plan will release more more uh, timber. Right now there's a, there's a large set aside and there has not been a forest, uh, a lands commissioner that's been willing to move this, this decision forward. Uh, the current lands commissioner, Hillary Font, is doing that and there's uh, a lot of political risk and a lot of challenge around that, but once the plan is, is decided and agreed to by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the set aside will become smaller. There will be impacts, there's no question because that will be a permanent set-aside, but in the end, there'll be less acreage that's set aside than right now. I respectfully disagree with that. The, um, the set of options that were originally created by department staff, Department of Natural Resources staff, in conjunction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, would have one option would have released more acres for harvest. The rest of the options would have sequestered more uh, from harvest, kept more timber from harvest. So all of those options satisfy the, the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. The legislature is the trustee. The legislature can, can do the right thing for the environment and the economy. All right, next question. Um, before, oh, okay. yeah. sure. okay. John Hayden, I live in Port Angeles. One of the largest problems that our justice system, both locally and statewide, is facing right now comes at the intersection of the mental health system and the criminal courts. At any time, upwards of 10% of our local jail population is comprised of people who are waiting to be evaluated for competency or who have been evaluated, found incompetent, and are waiting for much needed treatment. That's turned our jail essentially into a de facto mental health institution. This has happened because frankly, Western State Hospital is broken. What, if anything, can be done to fix that? All right. Mr. McIntyre, you'll begin. John, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And our good sheriff here says he operates a, not a jail, but a, but a mental health facility uh, in large part. And I agree with that. Um, mental health funding comes from the state budget. That's the next big thing that the, that the legislature is going to have to address. Um, the governor has an intriguing idea about um, 
creating a, a regionalized system of uh, mental health care, regional centers, small 16 and below beds for inpatient treatment and the like. That's something that really should be seriously looked at, I believe. Um, there are four things that the legislature uh, has to spend money on before everything else. Those are pension and my, okay, sorry. I'll get to that next. <laughs> Um, this is a huge issue. We're in the states in a court case with the Disability Association of Washington for our Western State Hospital for just this issue for forensic holds for evaluations. It's costing us about two to three million dollars a month. Um, and so we will be dealing with this issue just as we've dealt with uh, McCleary and education for the last two biennium. This will be a biennium that really deals with mental health. I met last week with the hospital uh, and both the staff and actually the police chief from Port Angeles, um, and Eric Lewis, about this issue. And maybe if we can, and also I talked with Mike Glenn down at Jefferson Mental Health about trying to get a transitional facility. As capital budget chair, it's odd, but it seemed odd to me, but no capital budget chair before me had really talked to the operating side around mental health or early learning or long-term care, some of these things. But we're starting to meld those two. So there'll be capital investments and operating investments to address this issue before we leave uh, this session. Thank you for sticking to your time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just try to finish my thought. Uh, the top four things that, that must flow from the state treasury are uh, contr contributions to the rainy day fund, service on the state debt, both interest and principal, K through 12 education, and staying true to our pension obligations for those uh, state and local employees that, uh, that participate. Number five, I think, is mental health. And uh, so that's the, that's my, my set of priorities. And the key to this, or one of the keys is, is it's, it's expensive and not a good place to have someone in jail when they have mental health issues. Same with the ER. So the more we can get upstream, and Port Angeles is doing a really good job. Uh, Chief Smith has hired a social worker that goes around with the patrol car and, and tries to connect that person with the services that they need before they end up in jail, before they end up in the ER. And that's what we need to do is we need to start looking at treatment and getting as far upstream as we can to avoid these expensive places like the ER and the jail or what's happening in Western. All right, Ms. Wilkie. This actually is a really deep passion of mine. Being a nurse, I've worked in long-term care, and we've had a lot of people with mental illnesses, and that's exactly what happens to them if they become uh, violent or out of control in the facilities. They end up in the emergency room. Often we have to call the police, and um, they're turfed there until they can get a bed somewhere else, which is generally not available. They can end up there for months. It's a really bad problem. My biggest question is why has the state budget spending gone up 45% in the last five years and we haven't been able to tackle this issue. So this is a huge problem that we need to actually take a closer look at our spending and what we spend it on. Because um, the pensions with the McCleary um, fix are going to go up with the, with the increase in, in uh, um, salaries for the teachers and that's going to put even a greater stress on our budget. And um, another thing that's super important in getting upstream of the mental illness problem is to offer services to high school and younger age kids. All right, Mr. Chapman. One of the reasons the state budget has gone up is we put $8 billion of new money into your public education. One of the shortfalls is we have not fully funded school counselors, mental health counselors for students. If you really want to address, if you're serious about addressing mental health, go into a school like I have, talk to a mental health counselor who has multiple schools, listen to the issues they're dealing with from kindergartners to first graders to second graders. I was recently traveling with someone to a meeting. He got a text from his wife, his daughter 
was threatened by another student and, I, and, and in a violent way, he was replying and I was making the assumption, I said, what high school does she go to? And he said, she's in kindergarten. <laughs> so, a lot of issues, eight billion of new money, which is one reason why the state budget is certainly higher, but we, that is a high priority for me is to fund those mental health counselors for schools, for students. Seconds more? Sure, yeah. Sure, you kind of stole my story there. <laughs> and that's okay because there's stories like that all over. I just got one in Forks the other day. I was out there talking to the high schoolers, and um, that was one of the big issues that they were concerned about. Was And the teacher told me that for every one counselor, they've got something like 1,300 students that they need to uh, deal with as far as um, mental health counseling, and that's totally unacceptable to me. So I would, I would encourage that. And I also do like the idea of the smaller, um, smaller facilities as proposed. One, one other rebuttal. Uh, I think, Steve, you're in the legislature when the legislature had a bill to address mental health issues. There's a reason the governor vetoed it. So I think that's, a, that's an issue. The legislature's certainly been wrestling with that. That bill was vetoed, so it's really imperative now for the governor to help the legislature. What, is his, what does he want to do? And it sounds like he's engaging a little more. The other thing is this probably would have been a great topic for a special session, a separate session dealing with mental health, school safety, school counselors. And I think sometimes we get so locked into, we had a short session, 60 days, we got to get done, we got to get back out on the campaign trail. I gladly would have suspended. No, no disrespect, but I gladly would have suspended coming to forums if we were in, le in the legislature dealing with these issues. So sometimes I think we should have some special sessions for one topic, short term, that are really important to the state. All right, next question. <laughs> my question refers to the Dungeness Off-Channel Reservoir, the project, and my question has three parts. Number one, funding. What are some possible funding sources and how would you advocate for them? Number two, a timeline. When do you think this could happen? And number three, the priority. With all the complexities of your jobs and the issues before you, is this project on your priority list? High, medium, or low? And this would just be for Steve Derringer and Jim McIntyre. Right. Um, yeah. so, so, so folks, may, this is, I think, the final piece in the water management uh, facilities, if you will, for the Dungeness, Dungeness River system. And it's uh, the DNR owns the land and the county who's going to wants to buy the land. I've had it in the budget the last three years. And I thought we were going to get it done this year. It's about $2.5 million to make the transfer from the DNR to the, to the county because you have to keep the trust sold in the DNR lands. Um, the governor's, because we put in the whole Hearst solution, we put $300 million to water res 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 resiliency and water resources. So I was going to use that money because this is a great example of how that money should be spent in my view. But this was kind of a spat between the legislative branch and the executive branch. They wanted us to give them the money, and then they were going to figure out how to spend it. Well, fast forward, I think we're going to get that transfer funded now. I think it should be funded by the end of the year, because it was a second tranche of funding. So that transfer will happen. Once that transfer happens, and the county's the agent, then they can go out and get other additional grants. And I suspect the capital budget or this water resource fund will be part of the solution to that. I think the total project is somewhere, it's coming down, but I think it's around uh, $20 million. All right, Mr. McIntyre. I'd, I'd certainly be interested to know how similar efforts um, undertaken in the past have resulted in more, more fish habitat and more fish in the rivers. Uh, and I, I certainly think that, that we should try to improve habitat where it, where it makes sense and where it's cost effective. But it, it is certainly uh, a part of the picture as are hatcheries and uh, things of, of, the, of similar natures. Um, aquaculture is something that uh, we can do here if we do it responsibly and well with uh, native species, not, uh, not species that are imported into the area and that sort of thing. So yeah, I would be a supporter of that. Um, effort to kind of close the, the gap in funding, whatever whatever may exist. My impression was that it had been pretty much fully funded already. All 
So, as the Dungeness is, is in the collaborative effort that's gone on, gone on there over the last 30 years is a, a leading effort in the state. As I travel around the state, having worked on the Dungeness, been chair of the Dungeness River Management Team, and worked on a number of these issues, I just kind of thought everybody in the state did work like that. Where the tribes get together, the agricultural community, community gets together, and the development community gets together, and they figure it out. That is not the case. So this is an example, of one of the best examples in the state of solving this very challenging issue of water resources for all the needs that are out there. So I, it's important to support it. Mr. Magister, would you like to no. All right. We're ready for our next question. Hi, I'm Jim Stauffer, I'm a Squim School Board Director, and I serve at the state level at the, on the Legislative Committee and Trust Lands Advisory Committee. So we appreciate all the work that fe our fellow elected officials do. So if you find yourself back in Olympia after November 6th, you're going to be facing four buckets of requests from the uh, WASDA. One of those is uh, ensuring student health and safety. The other one is invest in public school facilities and then promote school success and then increase funding equity. And the question is, how will you partner with your local school board directors and the school board directors throughout the state on these vital important issues? Thank you. That's for all. We'll start with uh, Mr. Chapman. I assume that question is for everybody, yes. sir? Yes. Well, first of all, I think we should, Jim, you and Cindy Kelly are certainly taking uh, statewide uh, leadership roles on this issue of advocating for school construction funds from the timber dollars, from timber revenue. You, you did a great, I don't want to take all my time praising you, because, but I should, because honestly, I don't think people realize how much Jim has put into this issue of making sure that local school districts get access to their timber dollars to keep your local costs. Just one highlight that's something that I've actually been surprised. This has not come up in any of our debates. The issue of should we lower the threshold from 60% uh, to build new schools. Uh, we've seen community school bonds go down with 58, 59%. Should any of us get 58 or 59%, we will think we had a mandate, but you can't build a new school. So I certainly support lowering that threshold. It looks like the consensus, the bipartisan consensus in Olympia is maybe to have a bill that would lower the threshold to 55% with the election on in the November election. Um, so I think that would be a great start. And your work on the timber revenue is certainly something that uh, you should talk a little bit more about. Okay, you have four different items there, and I'm going to try to touch a little bit on each one of them. First of all, I will state that uh, if we can improve um, access to monies from timber dollars, I would be all for that because that will help not only the schools, but it will also help the local communities and jobs, especially uh, places that are so reliant on those timber dollars. Um, <clears throat> student health, and uh, we touched a little bit about, on um, student mental health issues is something that I would definitely get behind. Um, and we need to have more counselors available to the schools and maybe take a look at uh, per capita funding um, that might make it a little bit more equitable for the rural schools to get the money that they actually need to have. Um, and that also touches on the funding equity issue. Um, and school success is a big concern for all of us. It does seem from the layperson's point of view that we continue to put more and more money into schools and yet the results don't seem to be quite what we want. And I'm going to have to leave it there. A couple of other, uh, since we're talking about schools, um, I sponsored, co-sponsored a piece of legislation, House Bill 1703, it would be a comprehensive school safety planning grant. I think one of the things parents need to realize is some of these schools are so old that we're putting our kids at risk, and so we need school districts to do a needs assessment. I think that's one of the way you can build support for bonds and new school construction is that get the parents upset that they're putting their kids in these some of these sub, um, structures or substandard. The work we did in Squim, that Steve did in Squim actually with the cross-laminated timber panels, 
in, in classrooms is a great example of new school construction, affordable, safe, and earthquake resistant. Mm -hmm. I think one way that we can keep school costs down also, um, if we are going to have such a school safety planning uh, and general requirements for each of the schools is if we take a look at making some standardized school designs so that we don't have to continue to re reinvent the wheel every time we build a school. That might allow us to keep some of the engineering costs down um, and, and use that money for something else that would be much better. Um, just an idea. All right, Mr. McIntyre. Well, I'm going to spend a minute on uh, school construction. Uh, to have timber revenues coming to, to the state budget and to local school districts, you have to have timber harvest. That's a necessary and sufficient condition to, to uh, provide non-taxpayer funds. Um, and I'm going to have to recognize Port Angeles Business Association in addition to Jim and Cindy who uh, the PABA really shone a spotlight on this thing early on and you certainly have done uh, great work to try to reconfigure OSPI rules so that you can get the money that that's owed to you. The, the, what we need to really look at I think in my opponent's budget in his committee is reconfiguring the formula for state, as state assistance to local school construction. Right now the formula in effect discriminates against tax poor school districts that can't pass construction levies or bond levies. And so I think, I think that's, that's a situation that needs to be reversed and I think a far greater percentage of the capital budget can come to local school districts for construction purposes to take some pressure off of local taxpayers, property taxpayers. All right, Mr. Theringer. Well, it's great that uh, our opponents here accept this idea because we set up a task force. The capital budget, as chair of the budget, capital budget, we set up a, a working group to look at the School Construction Assistance Program, SCAP. And partly because we have, in the capital budget, we have no way to control the exposure to the state on how many, when a bond passes, we basically are on the hook for about 30% of that bond. And during the recession, there weren't many bonds passing. Since the recession, there's been about $6 billion over the school construction bond. So we're building into our budget. We spent about $1.2, $1.5 billion this year in this biennial budget with another $80 million in the supplemental. So we need to get a better formula and a better, uh, and I think prototypical schools, capital asset models would be a good way to do this. And that task force has met twice, um, and they met today and are working on this issue and we hopefully will have something back before we go into session that we can look at to sort of manage school construction. I know that doesn't touch the other three issues you brought up, but... All right, Mr. Hackett, would you like to make 30 seconds? Nothing to rebut, but uh, that, that work on the construction assistance formula is long overdue. That should have happened a long time ago. But let's talk about school safety for a minute. You know, ensuring the safety of the school campus, I think, is, is in the province and should be in the province of the locally elected school boards, but it certainly needs some assistance from the state. Uh, school resource officers, um, some professional security person that could be on site or on campus, uh, I think would be something that the legislature could and should do. Uh, okay. That's it. Just want to touch briefly on the equity issue. As folks know, the court case, the clearly made us provide equity as much as we could around the 295 school districts. Just imagine, just here on the peninsula, the difference between Port Angeles and Squim and Port Townsend and Fort. That's a challenge. So the way we did that is we took away the levies and tried to level that and as Mike mentioned earlier We put eight billion dollars into k-12 education over the last couple of years So I don't think we have that formula right yet some of the levies that there's going to be a cliff particularly in Port Angeles uh, Squim is not as exposed 
the regionalization piece is challenging, and then special ed is another big challenge. So I think we're going to have to do some more work on education. It's our paramount duty, so we're just used to doing it. Right. This will be our last question. Okay. My question is concerning, I'm Deborah Pitt. My question is concerning I-1631. One part of the initiative states, and I quote, the Department of Agriculture shall develop proposed procedures, criteria, and rules for a program to increase soil sequestration and reduce emissions from the loss and disturbance of soils, including the conversion of grassland <coughs> and cropland soils to urban development. Are you comfortable with revenues from this initiative going to severely restricting housing development? All right, Mr. Sarah, you'll start. So just a, just a brief primer on development. And as a commissioner dealing with land use and me on the planning commission, for every dollar you bring in for, from a development, it costs you about a buck fifty in services. For every dollar you have on resource lands, you probably, it costs you about 98 cents. So it makes sense to manage your growth. If you're gonna provide infrastructure, transportation, sewer, water, broadband, it makes sense to concentrate that. We talked earlier about timber, con timber sequestration and the science is starting to show soil sequestration. And so as we, as folks know, uh, the oceans are absorbing most of our carbon right now. We can't grow shellfish here in Washington. They won't, they, they don't have enough calcium to be able to form that shell. So we need to address this. So I think being smart about how we manage our growth and using our resource lands to sequester carbon is a good strategy, both for us here in timber country and in agricultural areas. Well, just, just overall on that initiative, the, uh, the tax implications of it, it's called a fee, but it's really a tax. Fee tax doesn't matter. The effect is the same. Uh, it's going to increase the, the cost of fuel is going to increase the cost of the goods that we buy in all of our stores because they have to be transported here by truck. So it's going to have an impact on the cost of living. And so that, for that reason, in that reason alone, and I've talked about the economy and the, the difficulties that our working families are already having and seniors on fixed income, I'm against the initiative. The funding mechanism in the initiative itself is really kind of odd. There's a constitutional requirement that any and all spending by, by state government has to be authorized through an appropriation by the legislature. <coughs> in other words, a, a, a group can't just write themselves money in an initiative, which is what seems to be happening with this one. So just in general terms on the carbon issue and, and the global warming, Mother Nature does not care whether we live on this planet. She's not, it's not her duty to create an ecosystem that supports us. So we may be hesitant to pay taxes or fees. We may not want to limit land for housing. Mother Nature does not care about that. Mother Nature has sequestered for millennium carbon, and we've released it and it is damaging our ecosystem. And if we don't get smart, and we're supposed to be the thinking animal, to figure out a solution to this, we won't be around. If the choice and I misunderstood your question earlier, so I truly want to get this one right. If the choice is preserving farmland and allowing farmers to keep their land in farming land or turning it into development, I will support farmers, I will support farmland, I will support the ability to grow crops here locally every day of the week. This is a complex topic. And just backing it up to the idea of, of a carbon fee or a carbon tax is um, where I'd like to start with this. I, I don't support the carbon tax because I know the effect that that's going to have on our rural area out here. 
Uh, we are in a position right now to be sequestering a lot of this carbon, and um, we're not creating it. Yet we are going to be penalized by other parts of the state and other places around the world which do this. Now, um, I think it really depends upon which model you look at as to whether or not humans are to cause, or humans are, are to blame for the cause of uh, global warming. We know that this has happened over the history of the Earth. And, um, you know, if a volcano goes off, it releases a whole lot of carbon, just like um, fires, uh, forest fires do. Um, I think that we could do better on reviewing our scientific models before we start to put the um, pressure on people. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to our audience. I'm for yes, I'm leading up to that. I I'm leading up to that. Um, thank you to our panelists, and thank you to the audience for your excellent questions. Um, to end this panel, we'll now move to our candidates' two-minute closing statements, and we'll reverse the order from the opening statements. And we will begin with Ms. Wilkie. So thank you very much for the honor of running as a candidate for District 24 representative. I really do hope that you will vote for me. I ask for your vote. Um, I will bring a breath of fresh air into this legislature, somebody who has not been a career politician, who doesn't have the uh, political speak and that sort of thing. Um, I really am looking out for the people in this district and I've spent an incredible amount of time going around talking to people, finding out what's important to you. I think that myself and my opponent couldn't be more different, especially when you consider the initiatives. I think each of us are both on either side of, of those initiatives. For the um, 1639 uh, gun ban, I would vote no against that. For the 1631 um, carbon tax, I have also stated that I would vote no against that. I would support our police officers by voting no against the um, 940, which would handcuff the police officers and create a situation where they have to make a decision in cases of deadly force as to whether or not they're going to end up getting sued rather than protecting themselves and the people around them. And I think that's a terrible position to put our police officers in. And I would also vote yes to ban the grocery tax because I know how much that's going to affect our rural and our poorer people. One thing that I would like to see happen is that in all income levels in this district, our district is between 20 and 30 cents poorer. Um, that doesn't make any sense considering how prosperous the rest of our state has been. Having a prosperous district is going to trickle down to a lot of, and I hate to use that term because it's kind of been overused, but, but it will affect the hope that everybody has, whether you're a senior or whether you're a kid going to school watching the success of your parents. Um, it gives you hope for the future. It inspires people. It, it gives people an idea that they can do something good with their lives. And if I can lead a movement like that, I would be honored. Thank you. I would also oppose capital gains tax. <coughs> Mr. Chapman? Hey again, thanks for everyone. It's been a long night. Really appreciate everyone for being here. I, I've just been re your representative for two years, and here's here's what I'm proud of. I'm proud to have been part of a legislator that became the first na we became the first state in the nation to protect your net neutrality. I'm proud to be part of a legislature that in a 98 to nothing vote in the House and 48 to nothing in the Senate, we passed House Bill 2097 protecting religious affiliation from disclosure to your federal government. I'm proud to be part of a legislator, legislature that increased the pediatrician Medicaid reimbursement rate, which will allow the pediatrician that was going to leave Grace Harbor County to maintain an office in Grace Harbor County to serve kids in Grace Harbor County. I'm proud to be part of a legislature that funded rural hospitals. I'm proud to be part of a legislature that passed the Salish Sea Protection Act, expanding funding for oil spill prevention, and enacting a per barrel tax on oil as it moves through our Salish Sea, a once in a generational opportunity to protect the Salish Sea, and I'm proud to be part of a legislature that passed that. 
I'm proud to be part of a legislature that for the first time since 1943, earlier this year, updated the Equal Pay for Women Act. Had not been updated since 1943. Equal pay protections for women. I'm really proud that we were able to pass that. I'm also proud that we passed the Reproductive Parity Act, improving access to women's health care in Washington State. I'm proud to be part of a legislature that also approved a budget proviso to increase child care in Jefferson County. I'm proud to have been part of a legislature that earlier this year cut your property taxes 30 cents per thousand while still being able to put a billion dollars in the rainy day fund and getting out in a 60 day session on day 59 in 9 hours and 22 minutes. <laughs> I'm proud to have served you for 16 years as a county commissioner. I'm proud to continue to serve you as your state legis legislator. would love to go back and continue to work on the issues we talked a little bit about tonight. And finally, I'm proud to work for a state government that in this polarized world, we had 18 partisan votes in a short session. And we had 556 bipartisan votes off the House floor. We are a government that works well together. We're functional. We don't fuss. We don't fight. We got all of that done in 60 days while cutting your taxes. 556 bipartisan votes to 18 partisan votes. I'm proud to be part of that team, and I'd love to have your support again. All right. Mr. McIntyre? Well, you've heard me um, talk about the economy. We've touched on a broad range of subjects and topics tonight, all of which are important. But I, I really, really do believe you need a legislative delegation that understands the facts of what's going on in our economy in our 24th legislative district. Let me just leave you with one further statistic. If you look at the uh, GDP numbers for the three counties that comprise the 24th legislative district, you, you adjust those for inflation. Our economy has actually shrunk by a little over 6%. One other statistic, there are 2,200 fewer people drawing a paycheck that are wage, earn wage earners, not salary wage earners. Those two things indicate to me that we, we are not paying nearly enough attention at the state level where policy is made that affects the economy both positively and negatively and we need to reverse that we need to pay attention to rural Washington in particular the 24th legislative district and you know my history here in elected office elective office that has been my focus from day one when I took office as a port commissioner and until eight years later when I left office as a county commissioner that's what you need from a from your legislative delegation and I think I'm well equipped with over 40, 46 years of service to our country to accomplish that on the behalf of all of us, working families, seniors, businesses, nonprofits, and the like. So I, I, I really thank you, the League, for putting on this forum this evening. It's been uh, illustrative and informative. You have a pretty clear choice uh, when you get your ballots, which you probably already have today. And I would certainly like your support and would like to earn your vote. So thank you again for your kind attention and your questions. Yeah, I would just add to that. Thank you for coming. Um, it's always uh, a good way to learn. And we, we joke, Mike and I joke about being in the legislature in the representative side where we have to run every two years and that as opposed to that Senate, where they only run every four. <laughs> so that keeps us closer to the people. We get to do this more often, and I think, that, I think there's some value to that. We're getting towards the end of it after a pretty long primary campaign season, but it's always interesting to be here and do these things. And I really want to thank the league for doing that. And the timers, I don't know how the timers do it. You know, they, they're just looking at that watch, checking out the minute, the 30 seconds, so thank you for doing that. Um, it's been an honor to serve you in the legislature for the last four years. I think the hard work I've put in over the last four years has positioned me on my committees and with the relationships I've built across the aisle and across the rotunda with the other chamber and with the executive branch to be an effective leader to address the issues that we face, whether it be health care, whether it's school construction or school funding, whether it's our natural resource issues, transportation issues, mental health, that huge spectrum of issues 
And it takes a while to gain that experience and know how the system works and to build the relationships that can get things done and be successful. And as Mike listed, in 60 days we, were, we did a lot. In 120 days, I think we can do some things that really set our economy, stabilize our economy, deal with our mental health issues, deal with this continuing education piece, and we're going to have a lot of natural resource issues because of the orca whales, the carbon initiative, and that that we need to deal with for our long-term ability to thrive here on the North Peninsula. So I really appreciate your vote. Uh, I guess your ballots came today and you get three weeks to decide and uh, it's been an honor to serve you and I hope I get that opportunity to do it again. Thank you. Thank you to all four of our uh, candidates up here. Um, we want to thank you for appearing this evening. I hope you can remain afterwards and um, visit with audience members. Before we close, I'd like to invite any candidates who are running for any other officers who are in the audience to stand, state your name, and the office you're running for. Is there anyone running for an office who might be here tonight? Mike Doherty, running for County Commissioner, 3rd District. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank the candidates for running for office and for appearing here this evening. Thanks to our timers and to you, the audience, for your informed questions. Remember, ballots were mailed, and you should have them. Uh, your March ballot must be placed in a drop box or postmarked no later than November 6th. Ballots now have prepaid postage, so voters do not need to apply a stamp. Please remind your family, friends, and neighbors to cast their votes as well. For those unable to be at our forum, tell them that it can be viewed on our league website, lwvcla.org. For those who have moved since the last election or who need to register, the last day to register online or by mail is passed. But Monday, October 29th, is the last day to register in person at the Clown County Auditor's Office. Are you aware that voter turnout at the August primary in Clallam County was less than 50% of registered voters? We all have an equal voice, but only if we vote. I also want to tell you that the League of Women Voters of Washington State has developed a new resource that will help voters make important ballot decisions. Vote411 Dot org is a nonpartisan online voter guide that offers balanced and relevant information on candidates and issues on your ballots. All candidates have been encouraged to post their answers to questions on issues facing their local communities. You can pick up vote411.org bookmarks on the league membership table for further details. We also have these little things. <laughs> These little um, things to put on your refrigerator. <laughs> These little things. <laughs> Drop the swag, yes. Um, please do visit our membership table and consider joining our organization. Donations are also always very welcome. And that's what finances our ability to continue to offer these forums. Also, our state league, the uh, League of Washington State has provided summaries of the four initiatives on the ballot and copies are available on the table in the lobby. Thank you very much and good night.